Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming to this seminar at the uh, La Trobe University Department of Languages and Linguistics, our linguistics program, also the Centre for Research on Language Diversity. And today our speaker is uh, Deep Jyoti Goswami. So I first met Deep, oh, close to 10 years ago, I should think. Um, yeah. And <laughs> in that period, he um, was a, an MA graduate from the um, Department of Linguistics at Gauhati University in Assam. Um, he joined me several times in the field in the Rira or Ronrang village of Balinong. And of course, it has gone on to undertake his further research um, in Balinong. He did a, an MA degree at Payap University in Chiang Mai in Thailand. I think it was in 2016, 2017, that kind yep. of time. Yeah. And has been a PhD student with us since 2019. 2019, but with some yeah. interruptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, about which he will shortly tell you. So <clears throat> without further ado, I'll um, hand it over to you, Deep. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just share the screen first. Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you everyone for joining the seminar. So today I would like to uh, give you an overview of my research, a grammatical description of Prada Tangsa. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I would like to give some basic uh, information about my informants. So I have a uh, primary informant and secondary informants. So for primary informant, I have Satun Ronrang and she is uh, 55 years old. And most of my research, uh, I have done like most of my data collection and analysis, everything uh, I, I have done with Satum. Uh, I spend most of the time uh, with her. But uh, I would like to mention that that doesn't really mean that I collected all my texts and everything from her. So I collected my texts and uh, different lexical items and things from different people. But she's the one with whom I spent uh, most time analyzing my data. Uh, the reason for that is, as Stephen mentioned, I was um, kind of spending time in field from a quite a long period of time now. And uh, with her, like now, she uh, has little bit of uh, basic understanding about linguistics. And she understands um, like basic concepts, basic things like tones, uh, etc. So when I have to um, like uh, investigate about tones or any other grammatical properties, uh, she can basically identify those like she can just tell me that oh this is a high tone on the first syllable something like that so i don't really have to again and again explain her like what i really want to get from her about her language uh, so that's one thing she is uh, that's one reason that i'm uh, mostly spending time with her and again she is uh, a very active woman in the community and she has good uh, understanding about their language about the culture of uh, culture and also she is uh, she has a very positive attitude towards uh, the towards the language and she uh, wants to uh, contribute towards the sustainability of the rera language so uh, that's why uh, i found it uh, found her very sincere to work with and um, yeah so mostly uh, i gathered most of my uh, uh, analysis from her then uh, again, I have uh, in secondary informants, I have different uh, people of different age groups and uh, including different genders. Uh, so there are more people also. Uh, for, so here, uh, the first name, uh, Mansam Samma Ronrang. So he is a young guy who is a very uh, educated guy. Uh, he is actually by profession, he is a fashion designer. And he has a very uh, strong uh, attitude towards his language and culture. 
and right now what he is doing is he is trying to um, design like uh, do cultural blending of in his designs so he wants to bring uh, rera tradition and culture to the towards the global platform so he understand already about the importance of uh, their language and about their culture so that is why it's kind of easier for me uh, to actually work with him and recently uh, stephen and i we both arranged different kinds of meetings like a regular meetings with him uh, so that uh, we can give him some uh, knowledge about linguistics and how we work and uh, how he can actually contribute towards uh, this work and towards this community through uh, his knowledge about his language so um uh, so that's one reason that I am in touch with him uh, now. Uh, and then again, uh, right now, like if I have any problem with my data or if I am struggling with my analysis, then he is the one that I can um, uh, like uh, really get in touch uh, easily because uh, he is available in like all other young generations, like they are available in social media platforms. While my primary informant, uh, she is not very active in social media, so it's a little bit difficult for me to actually reach her if I have a confusion or something to ask. So yeah, so this is something basically uh, some information about my informants. And uh, now I would like to give some background information about the Rera language and the people. So basically, Rera is a SOV language. It's a uh, trans and tibetan woman language, and it's a variety of Tangsa languages. So it has uh, autonyms called Rera and uh, Ruera, whereas other people, like the outsiders, they call them by Rongrang or Roira. Now about their population. So the they have estimated like 3000 people uh, so this is based on uh, the different uh, community members knowledge like that's what they recently told me that they have uh, around 3000 people however uh, i would like to mention that in a 2011 uh, official survey i think from government of Arunachal Pradesh or uh, someone so they actually uh, uh, said that there are like around 2000 people but the community member um, they don't really agree with that and they are like intent to they, uh, do a uh, new survey about the population so i probably need to update this uh, but this is overall like the population uh, status now about the geographical context so um, the Rera people live in the state of Arunachal Pradesh in Northeast India. Uh, they originally came from Myanmar, uh, but unfortunately uh, today no Reras are found in, in Myanmar, whereas uh, most of the other uh, Tangsas or Tangsa people or Tangsa language uh, speaking people still live in uh, different parts of Myanmar. So in uh, Northeast India, the uh, mostly Rera is spoken in the state of Arunachal Pradesh, and some Rera people also live in the state of Assam, which are two neighboring states in Northeast India. So the majority of Rera population um, live in uh, Manmao town, Manmao village, and Balinong village. Uh, here, I just uh, quickly like to mention that there are six different villages uh, among, uh, I think four are in uh, Arunachal Pradesh, and two uh, villages are in Assam. So, but like Manmao and Balinong has the majority of population of Rera people. So, uh, and Balinong, uh, and sorry, Manmao is the, Manmao is the original place uh, where they first migrated from uh, Myanmar. But since Manmao is um, a hilly area, that's why, and life is uh, challenging. Uh, so they, most people migrated towards the plains in search of uh, fertile land with a good source of water and for wetland cultivation of paddy rice which is in Balinao. So now majority of population actually lives in Balinao village, which is uh, very close to uh, the Assam border. And as I mentioned, uh, a small group of Rera people also live in uh, Fulbari and Antham village. Uh, um, here, I would like to mention one thing that most of my data comes from Manmao town and Balinao village. Uh, um, even though I have done some uh, studies, some research from uh, the two villages, one village actually from Assam, uh, which is from Fulbari. Um, the reason for that is in Fulbari, in the Assam, uh, the village in Assam, they have a very small population of Rera people who are surrounded by different uh, communities like Assamese and uh, Nepalese spoken communities. And uh, the, the people, the Rera people, they switch a lot uh, to the other uh, 
uh, dominant languages. So uh, it's not. Um, uh, the, so the so when I try to gather data from the people in Fulbury, um, it's not really good um, their data for era like for for a uh, analysis perspective because uh, I think they probably speak like around 40 or 50 percent of era, whereas the rest is like they just use other languages like Nepalese and Assamese a lot. So. Uh, in order to get genuine data, I mostly spend time in uh, collecting in Manmao and Balenong village. Um, so here is the location of uh, the two villages. So B represents the Balenong village, uh, which is uh, closer to Assam. So if you, I yeah, if you can see my uh, see the pointer. So yeah, this is this is the border of Assam. So this is maybe 15 kilometer from Assam border, and this is um, um, yeah, this is easily accessible. The Balenong village is easily accessible from Assam. The roads are nowadays good, and also the distance is not very uh, very long, very far. But uh, for Manmo, uh, in past it was kind of a uh, difficult to reach there because uh, it's in the hilly areas and there is like curvy roads and the roads are not good uh, like muddy roads. It was kind of a risk, uh, kind of a risk. Uh, but uh, still, I have done um, two or three uh, trips to Manmo, whereas uh, I prefer mostly to work in Balinom as it's uh, more accessible to me. And then this is a satellite image of the Balenong village. Um, so yeah, uh, here in this picture, so uh, this is the place uh, where uh, I stayed. So this is my primary informant, Satung Rondrang's house. Uh, and uh, this is the place where I mostly stayed and done most of my analysis. And here they have these uh, big community uh, charts and they have a guest house near the church where I think if I remember well, it's uh, back in 2000, uh, between 2013 to 15, I guess, I stayed with uh, Stephen and we have done some wonderful work. And uh, I actually get a chance to work with Stephen and like really staying with him and uh, doing real linguistics field work. So that was a good opportunity, which I have done in this area. So this is the Balenong village. Um, now, uh, what I want to achieve uh, or what the community will get from my research. So basically, this study is contributing uh, towards writing a descriptive grammar in RERA. And uh, it would be the first in-depth detailed description of the language, since uh, there are not much uh, description about the language. Uh, also, this work can uh, perhaps help the community members to produce pedagogy or teaching materials. So um, I would like to uh, mention a couple of things here. So uh, basically, uh, the Stephen, uh, Stephen already knows. So uh, in, within the Tangsa communities, they didn't have a script before, and mostly all the Tangsa languages are orally spoken. But nowadays, from uh, several, uh, like couple of years uh, development, they actually Stephen, uh, with the initiative of Stephen and other people, other linguists and other local community members, uh, they have developed uh, some scripts uh, for the Tangsa uh, people. And the RERAs also uh, now understand the importance of their language and uh, they, they, they understand the importance of a script and they realize that they need some kind of a written uh, writing system to document their, um, uh, their language. So with this, uh, with this uh, grammar, grammatical description, uh, what they are expecting from me is that I uh, uh, that probably I can help them to create uh, uh, like teaching materials, like materials for uh, like small children, so that they can actually teach them in home. So basically, in the in different rural villages, the schools uh, they don't have uh, any other Tangsa languages uh, uh, are taught. Basically, those uh, are in Hindi or other medium schools. Uh, so that's why they don't get any chance to learn their language outside home. So that is why the community members shows interest in creating materials so that they can teach that uh, to their children in home or maybe uh, in community halls like church or somewhere. Uh, so they really hope that with a better understanding of the language, I, I can or maybe they can also uh, create materials uh, in order to revitalize their uh, language status. 
Um, now I would like to give uh, the classification, uh, like so the classification of Tangsa languages in terms of Tibetan Burman. Uh, so Berling in 2002, he divided, he classified the Tangsas under the Konya group, whereas uh, Grierson and Wegelin, they uh, further divided the Tangsas within Northern uh, Naga groups or Eastern subgroups. And uh, so they put uh, Rondrang within, within Northern Naga Tangsa groups and uh, Wegelin put it within the Eastern subgroups. Uh, then uh, Professor, uh, then uh, Stephen has further divided the Tangsas into Pangwa and non-Pangwa groups, where Rera comes under the Pangwa groups. Uh, here, the main difference between these two groups is uh, based on like uh, linguistics and non-linguistic differences, um, which I'm going to tell in the next few slides. Um, but basically the difference is that the Pangwa group sings a uh, particular kind of Briswell songs uh, called Vihu songs, whereas the non-Pangwa groups, they do not practice such uh, traditions. Um, yeah, so uh, about looking into their sociolinguistic status. So overall, the Tangsa languages are, uh, they fall in the level five scale of the expanded credit intergenerational disruption scale uh, by Simons and Fannings, uh, 2017. Um, however, so we actually in the level five, they are kind of a uh, risk of language lo loss, but still uh, they are they are declared as safe languages. But in reality, like for RERA, when it comes to RERA, it's actually in 6B, uh, which says that the language is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it's uh, losing users. So it's threatened. Um, and uh, yeah, I can see that like I can, when I, I was doing some sociolinguistic surveys about domains of use and uh, language context, et cetera, and the uh, use of the language in different uh, age groups. So I really saw the saw that the young generation, they struggled a lot uh, with the language. Like they, they have lots of switching to Assamese, Hindi or English, maybe in this uh, chronological order, uh, because they are, uh, they are uh, ran out of vocabulary. They have less vocabulary. And also it's interesting that recently I, I, I spoke to some of the community people and they think that this is uh, now become a heavy swell thing for them to actually switch to different languages and it's rapidly growing. So that is why they really think that uh, we need to act on this so that we can revitalize the language, we can create materials. Uh, so this research, um, I think with this, with the help of this research, they can achieve that, or I can probably help them uh, in doing so. Uh, now about the literature. So basically there is a very few literature on RERA. So Das Gupta in 1980, he first recorded the variety uh, in his uh, book, a synopsis of the Tangsas, where he uh, presents some word list and he actually identifies the three different tones, even though he didn't mark the tones, but he put the three same word with different meanings. So see, he identified the tones and then he uh, shows the pronoun system of the RERAs. And also he gave some uh, basic uh, uh, verbal morphology kind of things in his, uh, in his uh, uh, report. And then uh, Dibbalota Dotta in 2011, who, um, who uh, wrote a, or who recorded a collection of stories uh, about the RERA, but that book, uh, even though it's, uh, it, does, it's, it records the different stories, the historical and traditional uh, RERA stories and the, an account of uh, RERA migration history, but still the book is written completely in Assamese. All the stories are in Assamese, um, yeah. And then uh, Berlin 2003 demonstrates, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, he put the Tangsas within the Voroponia group. And then Voiglin also mentioned about the Tangsas in relation to uh, Eastern Naga and Northern Naga. And uh, Stephen, uh, he divided the Pangvas and non Pangba groups about within the Tangsas, and the Rera falls within the Pangba groups, which are known as the Northern Naga groups who sing a particular cycle of ritual and historical songs. Uh, called the Vihu song or Sahvi songs. And they have uh, person agreement markers on verbs 
that generally generally do not mark uh, hierarchical relations, unlike non-Pangva varieties. And one another thing about the Pangvas and non-Pangva varieties is that the Pangva groups uh, mark, they have the negative prefix, uh, whereas the non-Pangva groups, I think they have, they put the uh, negative affix uh, as a suffix. So they put it uh, after the verb. So that's one uh, another linguistic um, uh, criteria to reference it between these two different uh, groups. And then I have, um, 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 I have written a uh, paper, a, phono a, a preliminary phonological description, uh, which was published in the Journal of Southeast Asian Linguistic Society. And also I tried to um, uh, describe some of the grammatical like uh, functions in the language. Uh, I basically focused on uh, describing the nominal nominalization system in RERA and uh, the extended functions of uh, demonstrative. So basically about one particular demonstrative called Kara. Uh, so I, I tried to uh, describe about these uh, two main uh, aspects in the language. So uh, now I would like to talk about the research methodology for this research. So initially um, I collaborate with uh, the community members to get the best uh, quality data. Uh, it's often, um, I mean, uh, so first I met uh, Satum with, uh, with uh, like Stephen introduced me with Satum Ramram, my primary informant. So uh, I gathered collecting data from her and other people also, as I mentioned. So uh, there is a society called Rera Welfare Society who is uh, kind of um, devoted their time uh, to, uh, to uh, revitalize their language and to, uh, you know, like to do things um, for their community, for their culture and tradition and the language. So they have um, been in touch with me and they also helped me immensely uh, in order to uh, collect data and, in, in, and they also introduced to other community members so that I can gather uh, the data that I need, etc. So this was proven to be uh, very useful for me in order to collect and analyzing my uh, data for this PhD. And then uh, the data, the, the process of data collection was actually started at the initiative of Dr. Polas Nath uh, in mid 2008. And uh, then Dr. Uh, Stephen More in December 2008, uh, he started um, collecting data and later I joined in 2013. So um, that's like officially when I first um, got in about, got to know about the, about the radar variety and I started collecting my data. Uh, for so basically uh, from 2013 to, uh, until now I have collected uh, lots of data for different projects um, yeah and uh, for this research research basically my data collection was started uh, in 2019 uh, which was uh, basically between 2019 and 2021 uh, but uh, it was not supposed to be like that because uh, my initial plan was to go to India in, uh, like, um, and do the field work in 2019, uh, from 2019 December to uh, April 2020. However, because of COVID-19, it was uh, never happened like that. So I was uh, stuck in field and lots of different things happened. And that's why I was just not able to do any work um, in 2020. Uh, so, yeah, which I will come later and I will try to explain more about the COVID-19 effects on my research or on my uh, field trips. Uh, so about the data types, so I have uh, isolated lexical items for uh, which I used to investigate on phonology. So each item was repeated uh, three times in an interval of approximately four seconds, uh, followed by the word in a carrier sentence to record the data in, a, uh, in natural speech. And then I also have collected context-free elicitation data. Uh, so I want to mention that I do not really want to use context-free elicitation data in my thesis. However, uh, I believe that they sometimes help me or um, if I don't uh, really understand some kind of syntactic constructions or uh, when I don't know something about the language, then they actually help to frame uh, 
um, the 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 general aspects of a language. So if uh, when I was struggling with something, if I struggle to get any kind of information, then I try to uh, use context-free elicited data so uh, to see the structure. And then I try to find that in the natural text like narratives or stories, etc. So even though uh, if I if I need to use context-free elicited data in my thesis, I will always try to back those uh, with uh, natural text. Uh, and then uh, I, the most important, like the, I collected text data based on various semantic domains. So I have so far uh, uh, five traditional stories, a interview, historical narratives, and two procedural texts of uh, their traditional life uh, lifestyle. So all these stories were uh, analyzed, I mean, uh, transcribed and translated, and they are all, all, almost they are put, um, I have already entered them in flex. So they are being interlinearized in flex. Um, um, and um, actually like uh, I was about to finish that, but there are some problems uh, while I was trying to do the interlinearization in flex, which I will just uh, talk in uh, the next slides. So here is the, uh, the like the workflow. Uh, these two diagrams basically they are like uh, giving same information. So um, the recordings, then uh, the media files I transfer them uh, into my laptop, and then I play them in VLC player so that I know what information they contain, and then I re uh, rename them accordingly. And in every step, I try to back the back my back up my data in multiple platforms, and. Uh, for phonology purpose, I, I uh, use Audacity to seg for segmentation, and then I put them uh, in Pratt in order to investigate phonological data. Whereas for uh, syntax, it's mostly the, the previous steps are quite similar, uh, except I put the data in Flex in order to do um, transcriptions and translations and other uh, analysis. <clears throat> now, um, I would like to talk about the archives. So uh, previously, I was archiving all my data uh, in Genodo. So the, when, I write, when I wrote my uh, paper on phonology uh, and published it in JSILs, uh, there was, I think, a requirement uh, from them uh, to, uh, to archive it in Genodo. So most of my lexical data or my word list, all the audio recordings, everything was in uh, Genodo. So you can um, get them uh, by clicking this link. Uh, if you need, I can send it to you. And then uh, for this research, uh, after discussing with my supervisors, uh, they recommend me to um, archive my data in Paradisec. Uh, so which I'm looking forward to. So yeah, for this research, I'm going to use probably the first option. Now here um, you can see a screenshot of my Flex database. So um, I hope you can read this. Uh, it's a little bit smaller. I just put the screenshots. Uh, there are lots of information. So basically I have nine stories and then I also have uh, elicited sentences. Um, so for each of these stories or each of these sentences, uh, I have this baseline and then uh, I try to break the morphemes and I try to level them. I try to uh, level the word categories, et cetera, uh, which are followed by a free translation of uh, the, of the Reda, uh, Reda sentences. So this is how I was, uh, I am doing the transcriptions. Um, yeah, so this is another uh, screenshot from, uh, from Flex. Okay, so uh, now I would like to talk about the problems uh, doing my interlinearizing or in flex. So basically there was a, there is a lack of coordination between tones uh, from previous data and the present data. So when I say uh, previous data, it basically refers to the data that I collected for my master's thesis and uh, the, the paper and other projects that I was doing in past. And the present data is for this thesis that I have collected. So basically when, uh, so all of these data were previously entered in flex. So now when I entered my new data in flex, uh, the flex is designed a way that, you know, if there is a word previously entered and we enter the new word, it's supposed to uh, give you the previous information uh, with the same word. But for some reason, with many words, it's not happening. There is no, it's, it's just saying that there is no entry. So um, when I investigate, I found out that they have uh, the previous data has different tones, maybe 
you know, and maybe sometimes uh, the uh, conflicting results in the consonants and vowel phonemes. So the vowels are different, maybe. So these things happen, and because of that, it uh, the interlinearizing process gets a little bit slower. And then I, in order to solve this issue, I uh, I am going through all my recordings. I am re-listening uh, the recordings and trying to actually um, identify which uh, is like the more um, correct, uh, you know, way to put the data, like correct way to put the tones. So uh, I am almost done with it. And yeah, like if uh, with the tone specifically, like if I'm struggling uh, with, and I can't identify, uh, I take help of Pratt and try to uh, look at the spectrograms and things. And uh, those help me immensely in order to uh, finalize the tones. And there are still, you know, like sometimes um, some confusions happen. And then I just try to um, talk to my informants and over phone or uh, any other social media platforms, which really uh, immensely help me in order to uh, sorting the data. So I am almost... Uh, uh, almost done with uh, entering and analyzing my data in Flex. Um, now I would like to talk about the phonemic inventory. So uh, there are 21 consonant phonemes in RERA and eight vowels. A minimal RERA syllable consists of just the nucleus vowel, whereas a maximal syllable consists of an onset and a rhyme with a coda. And uh, RERA has uh, monosyllabic, disyllabic, trisyllabic, and uh, quadrisyllabic words. Uh, and, and yeah, of course, uh, words with five and six syllables also consist in RERA, but uh, they are very, uh, very rare in my corpus so far. And um, so here is the consonant inventory. So uh, RERA includes um, 21 consonant phonemes um, in um, oral and uh, including oral and nasal stops at the bilabial, alveolar, post alveolar, and uh, post palatal positions. Uh, places of articulation and then um, it has eight vowels um, so close vowels are produced in the front and back positions and um, yeah however however there is no central vowel and central vowels are of course um, in rera produced or found in uh, both uh, mid and open positions so these are uh, based from my previous uh, studies now uh, about the tone system. So RERA has, um, uh, according to my studies, they have uh, three um, contrastive tones in open syllables or in live syllables and one in uh, stop syllables. Um, um, yeah, uh, so they have the tone one, the tone one basically represents a high uh, rising tone and the mid tone is a level tone and tone two, tone three is a uh, low falling tone. Now I would like to mention one thing. So I didn't really mark uh, the fourth tone, which is uh, the final stop uh, tone. Uh, but uh, I just want to mention that Kellen Parker Van Dam, uh, who in his PhD uh, thesis, he actually uh, he actually um, talk about the fourth tone and he marked uh, as a, as it a, as the fourth tone where he said that the fourth tone tends to be inconsistent in terms of pitch and uh, it's consist consistently um, uh, shorter uh, than the other tonal categories which uh, for the for the shorter part i really agree because uh, that's what i also found i also realized in uh, all of my data and also one thing uh, I have noticed before that when I was asking uh, the uh, the native speakers uh, about different tones, uh, like especially the low tones, uh, they they struggle to actually identify the tones. Uh, they mix up tones, and I think it's because uh, Rera has a low functional load of tones. So maybe it's because of that. So I. I get uh, more data this time, and I am hoping to uh, investigate more on that uh, in this research. Uh, now I would like to give some examples about the uh, syntax of the language. So first, um, so to do that, I want to look on the demonstrative kara. Uh, so uh, this is a demonstrative which has a basic uh, distal meaning. So it's a distal demonstrative. Um, uh, 
um, but it has like, yeah, it has uh, extended and non-extended functions. So in its bare form, it's a distal demonstrative, meaning that, uh, but it has different uh, extended functions. First, I would like to talk about the non-extended functions. So it can be a noun modifier, which can occur uh, pre, uh, pre-head, post-head, and in both uh, pre and post-head positions in a noun phrase. And it can be a uh, adnominal use and it can also be a demonstrative pronoun in RERA. So here is an example of non-extended function of, um, of uh, Kara. Um, so in example 113, uh, Kara ware pivangsa ahaku, that man's cousin is very beautiful. Uh, here Kara function functioning as an adnominal demonstrative. And in example 112, uh, Kara functions as a uh, distal demonstrative. Like, Kara Asekam Jum, that is a red house. So these are like two clear examples of Kara functioning as uh, like Kara's, uh, the non-extended function of functions of the demonstrative. Now I would like to talk about the various uh, extended functions about the demonstrative. So it can be a topic marker, it can be a linker, it can uh, occur as a speaker stands, it can be a ex exclamation, then it can also occur as a discourse dictic expression and it can function as a uh, time adverbial uh, which mostly or more often occur in uh, narratives to proclaim uh, to proclaim a continuity of uh, events one after another and then it can also occur in a substantivization strategy and also in a tailored linkage construction now we, uh, I want to give, uh, like, show you one example, one or two examples about the uh, extended functions of the demonstrative. So as a marker of relative clause. So in uh, in this uh, example, Uirangwa Ngora Kara Jokfi Wachi Prato, the one who is called Uirang is the monkey. So here Kara functions as a marker of a relative clause. And um, yeah, um, and then in the second example here, um, Kara functions like Kara occurs in a tail head linkage construction. So these uh, two examples, if you see, so the tail presents the mainline event uh, while the head uh, recapitulates the information in the previous clause. So in example 137a, Pinsong Ta Hato uh, stayed uh, in the top of the tree. Uh, it's an event line clause uh, occurring as the tail in a uh, tail head linkage construction. Whereas in example B, uh, the adverbial clause, um, which is marked by Kara, uh, while staying in the tree, which is marked by Kara, occurs preceding the main clause of the next sentence, uh, which, uh, which um, uh, basically repeats, uh, repeats the same information. So this is uh, uh, this these kind of examples or these kind of tailored linkage constructions are more um, common in uh, narratives. Uh, I think they so um, they kind of claims or shows a sequence of events. So with these kind of uh, constructions, uh, the speakers exhibits um, different exhibits a sequence uh, of event in a uh, narrative or story. So that's why these constructions are more common uh, in uh, narratives in my data. Uh, so now I would like to talk about the COVID-19 and challenges. So it was interrupted by, my field trip was interrupted by COVID-19 lockdown in uh, while I was in field, as I mentioned. I was stuck there for almost a month. And I just mentioned that, I just want to mention that people are threatened over my presence as I, as for them, I might carry the virus as an outsider. So for them at that time, I was an outsider as I came from a different state. And then people also know that I travel from Australia and somehow at that, the situation made people uh, think at that time that COVID-19 actually uh, can spread by foreigners, something like that. So people are very uncomfortable over my presence in the area. So I was just trying to um, go back to my home, which was even not possible for at least a month. And I was stuck there with no work because no one is, uh, um, no one wants to work with me during that time. 
uh, and it was a very un unfortunate and um, uh, bad experience for me uh, at that time. And I tried a lot to get back home, um, even, even though all borders are closed, it was a very difficult situation. I tried to reach uh, local authorities, local police people. And uh, finally, after so many time, I got a uh, approval that uh, someone from my family has to had to drive to my place and then they need to uh, uh, bring me back and they were not even allowed to stop anywhere during the road so i need to mention that the road uh, the distance between my home and the place was 750 kilometer and the roads were very bad so it took like 16 15, 17 hours so my uh, mom who is 57 years old she had to drive uh, to bring me back and it was really horrible for every each one of us and but finally somehow i made it back home and uh, it's kind of interesting that when i get back home uh, people in my village for them now i am an outsider because i travel from a different state and that's why some villagers they actually complain like they filed a complaint in the police local police station but fortunately i had like uh, official document to travel so i was not in trouble but this is something ex some experiences or some very unfortunate event that happened uh, during my field work and also uh, after that, I was planning to uh, actually work from home, but uh, I was not able to do so because two of my family members, uh, my sister and my father, they both got uh, COVID uh, seriously and they were in ICU for uh, like almost a month. And uh, it was very uh, unpleasant situation for me during that time. And it was just not possible for me to uh, uh, continue any work um, like officially. So most of this time, like in the last two years, I was just on leave. And uh, yeah, of course, try, I tried to do some work my, uh, by my own, uh, but not able to do any field work uh, uh, during this time. But uh, I just want to mention another thing that uh, this situation doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't say that I can't go back now. Uh, I actually went uh, recently, like before, my, before I came to Australia in uh, last year, December, I made a field trip. Uh, and I stayed there and quite a good amount of time and I have collected like a uh, good quality amount of data. So uh, yeah, now things are normal and people are, uh, there is no problem in going back uh, to field again. Uh, here is, uh, here I just uh, am, uh, I just want to show you a screenshot of my timeline for the thesis. Uh, so I made a timeline uh, how I'm going to work on uh, based on different months and during this year and the next year. So um, yeah, basically I started my PhD back in 2019. And uh, yeah, I was doing library research, like uh, doing lots of readings during that time. And I, I was planning for the field, field trip, which I uh, eventually I went and then it was interrupted. So basically, uh, mostly between 2020 and 2021, I was mostly on leave as I mentioned. And then this is the timeline for 2022. Uh, this is just a part of my timeline. So uh, I was just spending time on writing, on working on chapter one and two. And uh, now I am writing on chapter one and two. And uh, then today is my confirmation and like that. So I have uh, documented or planned all my uh, thesis timeline until my final confirmation uh, till next year. So I have uh, made a, a good plan and hopefully I can um, execute this plan uh, for which I think I need to uh, really work hard, which I, I think I can. Um, yeah, so this is the reference and Kesu Azom, thank you so much. So I welcome questions now. Thank you, Deep. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, do you want to unshare the screen so we can see everybody? And lovely photo there at the end. Um, so, would anyone like to ask any questions? I, I can't see. Uh, John? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Deep. And uh, as I, I may have said to you before, I'm really sorry to hear about uh, that very difficult time with your father and sister. And, just, I, I really hope that the health is continuing to be better now. Um, I have a question about 
You talked about how in the Panghua versus non-Panghua group, the negator, they're differentiated by a negator going either before or after the verb. I'm just curious, and this is interesting to me because I, I got really interested in whether neighboring language varieties can be differentiated by ordering principles and how often that happens and why it happens. And so for this particular instance, I'm wondering, is it the same negator? Is it like a cognate negator? Is it the same form or are they like different negators that grammaticalized separately? Um, I, I, I think it's the same negator. It's the, uh, you probably remember because you were, you have some experience on Rera. So, uh, this negator is the me, the me, uh, mm. um, so yeah, like for, uh, to go the, they have the word like ka. So if, uh, they have to say like not going or something, so they will say Mika lang. Uh, so it, it comes before the verb, whereas, um, um, other like non pangva varieties, they would, they would probably put something like kami or something like that. So, yeah, I think in most, uh, pangva varieties, the, it's the same. I, 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 uh, yeah, mm. I think so. Yeah. But I don't have much knowledge about like, uh, about the other neg negative sub prefix. But still, yeah, at least as far as I know about Mosangs and uh, some other varieties, yeah, I think it's the same uh, negator. Do you know, is that very socially, sociolinguistically salient for people? Do people really note this as, like the native speakers, do they see this as one of the main things differentiating the ways they talk? Uh, um, yes, I mean, like, uh, so recently also when uh, I was uh, talking to some of the members from the Rera Welfare Society, and uh, uh, they actually like asked me about the Pangba and non Pangba groups uh, based on uh, Stephen's uh, 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 description. So I was telling them about these differences. And they like before I told them about the me. So I they actually came up and they, they told me that, oh, you know, like uh, with the non Pangba, like they call me calls, they specifically took name about a variety which is non Pangba spoken in, I think, in Myanmar. And they actually said that, oh, okay, they have this negative, uh, like the no, you know, uh, so the no uh, goes after the verb. So okay. they identifies, so they knows. Yeah. So, cool. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But no, I don't, I, I'm afraid that all people, they, they probably don't know. It's like people who are uh, really, um, you know, getting to get, like to get some knowledge about the language who are wow. involved in these things, they probably are aware about these things. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Other questions or points of discussion? I, I said, uh, go, yes, go on. Oh, uh, I was just, I don't think I've seen that terminology before, live and dead syllables. That's a, a new one to me. Um, <laughs> uh, so did you want to go back to that slide, Dean? Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that terminology come from? Uh, I think that's uh, what I used during my master's in Payab. Like my supervisors, they recommend me to use that. Like instead of open and closed syllables. Um, yes, I think it's quite quite well used in the Thai language family, live and dead. That's what I was taught. Is that right? Okay. Mm. Oh, you learn something new yeah. every day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so the dead syllables are closed by an obstruent. And the yep. uh, live syllables are either open or closed by a sonorant, correct? Yep. That's the definition? Yep. Okay. So, I mean, as you, I'm sure you know, it's very uh, cross-linguistically common for the live syllables to have the full set of tonal contrasts hmm. and the dead syllables not to. What I'm finding interesting is that the dead syllables <laughs> um, uh are only showing a low tone. Mm. Is, have I, yeah? Yeah. And yeah, but like, I think like when uh, Kellen mentioned that it, it has a like a uh, little bit of rising tone, uh, like low rising, I think it's somewhere between uh, two to four or something like that, or maybe two, three, something like that. So is the low that occurs so you're saying that the low that occurs on the dead syllables is different to the low that occurs on the live syllables? Uh, in in terms of uh, pitch, yes, like it's it's a very the the tone on the dead syllable is quite short compared to the 
Quiet what, sorry? Quiet. Uh, it's sort. It's like sort or very sort, like, you know. Yep. Like okay. it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of sort, like it's, uh, yeah, it's just false, like, yeah, it's, it is a dramatic fall, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually um, never like investigate on the like the, the stop syllable because I was just addressing it as a stop uh, tone. So uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just I just found it interesting. And where did you say that the speakers were having trouble with the tones? Was that on all the tones? Um, or, not, or was that not, just on not, those dead syllables? Sorry. Uh, no, it's on live syllable. It's mostly between tone two and tone three, which is the mid and low tone. And they're not confident in it. Um, I mean, if I really like, if they're conscious, then they can actually say, "Oh, okay, yeah, this is this is low tone. This is the mid tone." If they if they uh, pull up the two contrastive words, let's say, if they can find two words with the mid and low tone, then they can clearly say, "Okay, this word is the has the mid tone, and this word has the low tone." But in isolation, probably sometimes they struggle. Yeah. Oh, so they can find minimal pairs, but in isolation they struggle. Yeah, but okay. not. I uh, I think it's not always. Uh, uh, it's not common with every people. Uh, I found it uh, with uh, oh, my sorry. secondary informant it's, and. It's not uh, common. What? Sorry. Uh, it's not common with every speaker. Like uh, it's sometimes. I guess it's uh, it's something about the young people. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I I saw that with my primary informant, who is like an elderly person. But mostly I saw that with young uh, people. So maybe there is some kind of a language uh, change or something occurring, like, you know. So the younger generations are less confident. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it just shows us just how much of a gray area there, well, how much variation there is in, in what are called tonal systems Yeah. in terms of how categorical, how clear yeah. um, they are. I, I won't bang on. I can talk about this yeah. with you another time. Yeah. Thank you. No, but I think that's a very valuable point that you make, Maria. And one of the things that I think um, is often an issue here is whether the stopped or dead tones should be counted as or should be analysed as a <clears throat> as being the same as one of the live tones, or whether in fact they are different. And all across Southeast Asia every imaginable different possible analysis is, is presented. So, yeah. Other questions? I was just, uh, the question I, I was interested in deep was on this whole matter of education, because I know there is some desire to teach the languages um, in those villages and people want to produce teaching materials in Tangsa language, but in so many of those villages, you have people speaking multiple varieties. And like in the case of Balinong, yes, you've got Rira people in Balinong, but a very short walk away, you have the um, Nampuk Mosang village, and then in a slightly different direction, Jing Potar, which is uh, uh, Lo Chang village, and, and they speak completely differently. So have you in your recent discussions had some contact and discussion with people about um, <clears throat> about um, the the question of how to proceed with uh, education in the mother tongue. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I actually talked to um, uh, Longman Rera, the uh, president of RWS, uh, maybe two or three days ago. And um, uh, that's what he actually brought up about this conversation that he is interested in uh, doing something because he himself probably was writing something, some kind of like children's book or something like that, um, he, that he mentioned to me. And then uh, because I was basically trying to uh, know about the different domains and the language uh, switching in his uh, community. Uh, so then he... Um, he basically told me that, yes, like when they go out, they just uh, switch a lot. And that became habitual for them now uh, after doing it for so many times. Uh, 
Uh, and then at that point, actually, they believe that if we are continuing to do these things for a long time, then I don't think that we uh, the there will be any rare people left uh, after some time. So that's what they realize now. And then he said, what would be the solution? So he uh, thinks that if he can like create something like Dibalata Dotto, like a small book that they create, if they can create something like that, very simple things with maybe some uh, alphabets like if we can able to like you know uh, uh, develop the script or they can adopt any script that we are already introducing in that area so then they can probably do some uh, some materials uh, using those things and they can uh, hand it to their children in home uh, because that's the primary thing they are doing at inside their home like i asked him like even though i know like mostly within their home like within their family they mostly use uh, rera like 90 to 95% so there they want to introduce these books. At least they want to give some kind of materials to their children's hand so that when they are playing, they can at least play a rare book. That's what he exactly told uh, me. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it's two o'clock um, and people have to leave and go to other um, <clears throat> other meetings. Is there anything else that anyone else would like to say now before we thank Deep for the presentation, um, full of information and uh, um, background and all sorts of things. And I remember very well the discussions that we had when you were still in the village, when you were stuck in the village and people were spreading rumours that you were carrying COVID and so on and how how frightening that actually was. Um, so the, the full story of that might be worth telling one day. Um, so if there's no further questions, um, I think uh, you could um, stop the recording 